Guy Morris, welcome to the Bookaholic Podcast. Deidre, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, glad that uh, you are here today as well. And we've just got to dive into a whole lot of things because you are a whole lot of a person. Okay, so... <laughs> So you've written a lot of books. You've got a lot of books out there and they're thrillers. Mm -hmm. And before we get into the books specifically, we must tell the audience where you're coming from because you're a man of many different faces. And I mean, it's just incredible the life journey that you've been on. I ask a lot of folks, you know, I've talked to lots of folks who've been lawyers and became writers. I've talked to a lot of book coaches, uh, publishers. I've talked to a lot of people. I'm going, I'm getting, getting closer and closer to my 100th episode. Wow, congratulations. And, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, uh, but I've never met anybody whose writing experience started from such an extensive life journey. And mm. uh, and we've just got to get de delve into who you are and where you've been before we get to your books. Now, let me try to, because, because you've got a lot. You've got a lot. And yeah, so, I, I, I was just thinking that this is, this is going to be the 30-second commercial version <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not, I, I wouldn't know how to fit that journey into even an hour, but I'll, I'll try, oh, and, see I, I can, I'll try and see if I can hit a few highlights. Um, well, well, here we go. Well, first of all, your childhood was not golden, okay? No, you, no, you became anyway. a homeless runaway. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, I came from an extremely violent, um, alcoholic, drug addicted, dysfunctional um, family on sexual, almost on every level of abuse. It was, I, 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 and then gave me complex PTSD, which I wasn't diagnosed until my 50s. But I wow. ran away first when I was four, then again when I was six. Those two didn't last more than a day or so. Uh, but then I, I was gone. I left home at 13 uh, for several months and then left home for good when I was 15. Wow. Um, and I, it was a, a journey of learning self-preservation and, and self-reliance and determination. And, um, and, and it was, it was a, a lot of hard lessons, a lot of unpleasant situations that I had to, um, work through. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I didn't want my past to define my future. And, uh, mm -hmm. by the time I was 19, I was already married and with wow. a toddler when I got an incredible uh, God-given opportunity to go back to college. And now, wow. honestly, I thought this was just a huge waste of time because I was functionally illiterate. I didn't even, I never took SAT scores. I never finished high school. I got a GED, but that was only mm -hmm. because I had work credits from working alongside migrant workers. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of going to college for me seems sort of like, you know, you know, you're gonna send your puppy dog to, to be an astronaut. It just seemed completely ridiculous. Yeah, uh, but yet um, through I do mean tireless. I think I slept about three, four hours a night for several years. Um, mm -hmm. I worked my fanny off, believing that my future and my life depended on what I was doing. And it did. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I, I graduated with multiple degrees in my undergrad. I uh, built a and part of that was to build a macroeconomic model. Mm -hmm. That it turned out outperformed the Federal Reserve as long along with every other bank and, and major bank and university in the nation. Yes, that model a lot got me a scholarship into grad school and my first job with IBM. And from there, I spent 36 years in Fortune 100 companies, working my way up, often reporting to CXOs or vice presidents. Uh, and many times basically being given the opportunity to basically build my own team uh, from scratch and build my own group from scratch. Um, right. I was known as a innovator, particularly in technology and organizational mm -hmm. formats. Um, I worked with early stage internet before anybody even knew what the internet was um, to use, to do international communications. Mm -hmm. um, I was involved in early stage artificial intelligence, um, implementing that into our operations. Mm -hmm. um, I had to re redesign part of the culture of micro 
Microsoft services so that they would basically go after major projects. And I was a, started a group to go after those projects. And we won about anywhere from 35 to 65 percent of the deals we worked on, which is extremely high for the industry. Um, but I, I during all of those years, I also wrote songs for Disney, recorded my own CDs, produced an award winning winning espionage webisode series that ironically was the root of one of my books and <laughs> brought the FBI to my home. Oh. Uh, now, now at the time I was thrilled because it meant that my analysis, it was, it, it had to do with a program that had escaped the Lawrence Livermore laboratories at Sandia, which is a well-known NSA spy lab. Oh. So when I figured out how a spy program could escape the NSA labs and why they couldn't find it, um, I had two FBI agents show up at my door. Now ah. that freaked my wife out of, to no end. She's like, okay, why are there two FBI agents sitting in my dining room? What yes. do you do? <laughs> and who <laughs> are you really? So um, who did I marry? This so, sounds like a Netflix episode. It was, it was, I, I thought it was humorous. Now the FBI had no sense of humor about the situation at all. They were rather oh. perturbed that I had figured out something they were convinced was top secret. And um, so anyway, it was, that was one of the inspirations for one of my books. Right. Um, but I was also a uh, Coast Guard charter captain license. I led worship in Venice Beach, California. I went diving, cageless diving with sharks. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've, I, I have had a, uh, and I raised my son aboard a 50 foot sailing cutter. Um, so I, I felt like, I started off extremely rough. Now, during this time, I, I still had to struggle with the aftermath of post-traumatic stress. And, and I didn't yes. know it was that it, what it was at the time. I, I only knew that I had chronic depression, hyper anxiety, uh, multiple addictions that I had to go through, multiple 12 steps to get over. Um, but I, I never wanted to I never wanted to allow that to remain my reality without fighting against it and fighting mm -hmm. for my, my, my peace, fighting for my, my, um, my sense of well-being, my sense of purpose. Um, and yes. so it was throughout my life, include, and which included explorations in Central America to go explore Mayan ruins and research for a book that became, that took me to almost 15 years to write, um, in, which included getting death threats from cartel thugs. Yes, um, that I had yes. to stand up against. Now I was a street kid, so when they threatened to kill me, my first response is, "Oh no, you didn't." <laughs> and they they weren't expecting that from a little white gringo. So uh, it yeah. was a it was yeah. my wife was freaking out about that too because she witnessed that too. Oh, so um, I've 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 put the poor woman through a few traumas here and there. Um, yeah. One of my, my first cageless shark diving was feeding sharks and it was on my honeymoon. So she was like convinced that, okay, I, I just married you yesterday and I'm going to bury you tomorrow. <laughs> you know? um, this woman is a saint, wherever, whoever she is. She, she is an angel. Yes. She's an Irish angel. And I'm, I'm, I'm more than fortunate to have her in my life. I can't, I can't even imagine. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. And, um, through corporate jets, I was involved in some of the early EPA and, and some of the, uh, earliest climate change studies. I was actually in the boardroom on the day when, uh, they, some of the first studies were presented and the chairman and the board flew off the handle, went into a red face spittle tirade and threatened to fire anybody who brought this subject up again. So, oh. um, Gosh. All of those things I was, um, and many, many, many more that I couldn't begin to talk about in the time we have, mm -hmm. um, start to filter into my books. Yes. And yes. What I, yes. what I really love about my, I, every single one of my books is premised on uh, real history, real events, real technology, real politics, real religion, and, and what I call it, what my wife calls an obscene amount of research. Right. Um, well, well, boxes well, and stacks of research. Well, before we dive into your writing process and into your books, I just would like to make a couple of comments for those mm -hmm. that's listening out there. And we can often think, and this is not has nothing to do with books, but we can often think that, you know, our life is going in a negative direction and that there's no rescuing our lives and my life is 
doesn't matter. So I'm just going to keep going down the negative road. This, your actual, what you just said defeats all of that. Um, you had after <laughs> threats and being a homeless uh, child and running away, you still were able to uh, marry a person, even though you were young and sustain your family. Um, you were able to go on various adventures. You were able to get a college degree and be a well-recognized and um, person in your careers at the at the particular time. So I'm just want to let everybody know that you know sometimes you think, oh gosh, I'm too old for these things, or everything's gonna life goes so fast, I won't be able to do X, Y, or Z. You've done all these things and have overcome. And when you talk about all those different uh, 12 step programs, mm -hmm. you know, that's that all of that stuff takes time. So I'm just a lot of energy, yeah. Here. The time and energy, a you know, the whole mental. So it you pay, people can do it, they can go beyond, and you can still get yourself whatever you want to call it, quote unquote, together, you know, before whatever you think everything is going to end. So well, just, and to be honest, some of these things took decades, but yes, I knew that I saying. could never be the man that I want it to be, that I envision myself to be until I could honestly, ruthlessly face the man that I was yes. and, and, and do something about it, not just and take accountability for it. Right. And right. Um, there have been some people that I've hurt that I wish I never would have along the way. Um, my first marriage was a disaster. I lost my daughter as a result. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a, there's a real easy tendency to allow, to, to want to allow defeat to, to define us. Right. And I think in retrospect, and I could never see this for years, but in retrospect, being homeless as a child with no one else in the whole world to depend on and everybody else in the world to be afraid of, um, yes. it, it, it gave me the sense that I was the only one who had the power to change my stars. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, it wasn't something anybody was going to do for me. Um, right. It wasn't something I could expect from society or the world. It wasn't something I could expect from my family, which basically had written me off in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, but it, if I failed, it was only going to be because I failed myself in, in, in not being able to put enough effort into what I was doing. Right. And, um, and that took courage and it was painful um, to yes. face your past is often painful. Um, but I, I had started, I was suicidal at age six um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to, to move past that, to, I say, well, if I'm going to live, I'm going to try and live my absolute best life. Now, I don't watch a lot of television. I don't spend a lot of time in leisure. I, because of that, I felt like I, I, my life has been redeemed. I owe it back to be as productive as I can, as old yes. as I can. If I'm yes. working on the day that I die, that's a happy day. Right. Exactly. Most definitely. Most definitely. Yes. I'm glad you said that. That's why this is also going to qualify in my uh, playlist about mental health awareness, mm. um, because it takes a lot uh, to get from one place to the other. And this will help a lot of people in that arena as well. So as we have put it out there, all of your corporate background, <laughs> you're running the FBI drug cartels, <laughs> feeding sharks <laughs> and all of these things, you know, so they're the backdrop, some of these experiences to your books. Now, so with all of that said, first, how did you become a writer? Just from those ideas? Is that what intrigued you to? Well, yeah, a few things. things. One, I think, was um, in college, one of the things that inspired me the most, beyond figuring out how to get a degree and how to succeed and that, 
was learning how to read and learning how to read yes. history and read other literature because I was functionally illiterate before I went. Right. I barely read ever yeah. read anything. And so reading some of the great novels, Hemingway and uh, Mark Twain, and, and were two of my favorites, uh, mm -hmm. because they had a realistic view of the world. They, they weren't trying to come up with something like a fantasy world. They, they really had a view, realistic view of the world with all of its problems and all of its mm -hmm. potential. And um, that really inspired me. And the men of the Renaissance were men that were trained in science and they were in, in architecture and, and art and religion and politics. They were well-rounded people. Mm -hmm. And so for me to go after a highly technical, analytical, brain numbing type of career, such as economics and business and finance and all those things, mm -hmm. I needed to also pursue um, the things of the artistic things that I loved that would help balance me out, that would help me not to get too focused. And, and I knew people that were, you know, you get them outside of work and they didn't know how to talk about anything other than the sports game or the work. They had yes. no other interests. And, yes. and I didn't want to be one of those kind of people. Yes. And so I started writing actually um, because I was a single parent. I had a lot of time on my hands at night. I didn't have any money at that point to go mm -hmm. out and have a social life. And But I did have access to a lot of computers. And so mm -hmm. I started writing a short story for my son. He, at the time, he was a really voracious reader. We'd go to the library every weekend. He'd get three or four books, finish them off by Thursday and be bugging me, you know, kind of antsy until Saturday again. And yeah. so I thought, well, you know what? Uh, he, he, typical 12 year old boy, you know, he likes pirates and he likes lost civilizations and lost treasures and anything with a ghost or something paranormal was cool. And right. so I started writing him a story. It was called Paolo and the Shark. And yeah. it was um, sort of like an old Hemingway's old man in the sea, but for a 12 year old uh, getting yeah. over. And the focus was him. He had a lot of fears and social fears and and bullies. And, and so it was helping him to kind of get over past his fears while learning him, teach him how to face those. And but yeah. Paolo kind of had some backstory that I never really delved into. And he read the book. All of his cousins read the book. It was I never tried to publish it, it was, but it was a family favorite. And so mm -hmm. I started writing a sequel to Paolo and I started, I wanted to research something real. I wanted to basically just come up with a real story that I could use as the basis point for the fictional uh, plot and characters. And mm -hmm. in researching um, Caribbean history for, because the, the first book had taken place in the Western Caribbean um, on a fish, on, on a small Island. Um, I, I landed on an incredible story. And that just hooked me. I, I just couldn't put that story out of my head. And th and it was essentially, all, to make it short, um, 1672, Henry Morgan raided the city of Panama. It was the richest city in the mm -hmm. new world. I won't go into all the reasons why. He ultimately lost right. half the men in the raid. He came back with over 30 tons, at least 30 tons, roughly a billion to a billion and a half dollars worth of plunder and 600 slaves. But when he reached his fleet, he cheated everybody and disappeared with almost everything on three ships that were never seen again. So oh when Morgan God. showed up in Jamaica four months later, he was arrested immediately and sent to England because mm -hmm. when he raided Panama, he broke a peace treaty. But in London, the guy's a freaking hero. So they knight him as Sir Henry Morgan. They sent him back to Jamaica as lieutenant governor with a garrison of soldiers to get rid of piracy. But instead of going after any pirates, he only went after one man, a guy named John Searles, who was the captain of the Cagway, who cheated him on the raid to Panama, supposedly. It's right. nice. And he never went after his billion dollar plunder. He'd already killed thousands of people to get. He went into this drunken, haunted debauchery and burned his logbooks before he died. Three years oh. after he died, the whole city of Port Real sinks into the ocean, including his grave. At the time, many of the locals said they had been cursed by Morgan. Now, I was fascinated with that story. All of that's a <laughs> I am too. And I wanted to figure out two quick, things. Quick sidebar. Quick sidebar. Mm -hmm. Is this the Captain Morgan that's on the... That's the real, the Captain, that's the real Captain Morgan. Uh, oh, my God. It's actually Sir Henry Morgan now. Um, and he was admiral over a fleet of 36 ships on the raid to Panama. Um, and so that was his real life. He, that was that was some of a real story. And mm -hmm. I read every book written by him. I read his biographer that was on the raid to Panama. I read and there wasn't a whole lot, but I, I went through every rumor of every place he had ever been 
because I had to figure out, I wanted to figure out two things. One, what happened to 30 tons of stuff, three ships and 500 souls? Surely by now, somebody would have found something. And in wow. fact, somebody did. A guy named F.A. Mitchell Hedges in 1911 was digging on this mm -hmm. one island that turned out to be a key to the whole story. And he, mm -hmm. several months or about four months before he disappeared with roughly $270 million of newly smelted gold, today's dollars, mm -hmm. he, um, he claimed he had found Atlantis, which I thought was an incredible claim. Um, but I tied Morgan's, but I wanted to find out. So he found something and he, and even he, when he wrote his memoir, was afraid to talk about, refused to talk about how he found the gold and where he found it on this island. Um, and so, but I tied that island to a, a, an Inquisition massacre that ended a 2000 year pilgrimage before the Spanish tried to find out why people were canoeing 50 miles over open ocean to come to this island. What was mm -hmm. so special about this island? I tied that pilgrimage to the Mayan 5,000 year calendar. And I realized that that calendar lined up and was tied to the Mayan creation myth, which had said that the earth was created and destroyed three times before the Spanish arrived in 1514, 1517. Hmm. And that was the epoch. That was the calendar that ended in 2012. Yes. That people were so scared of. At, well, and there's, they were frightened in part because there was a prophet that predicted the Spanish would come. His name was Chalam Balam, and mm -hmm. he wrote end of basically some prophecies about the world that that would exist at the end in the time frame we're living in right now, which we called the the uh, fourth epoch. Oh, so um, all of these things were just I just as I said I spent over ten years researching and another few years trying to figure out how to pull all of this together into a really cool action adventure thriller story um, mm -hmm. during the trip and my I went diving um, on and doing research I, I talked to some really old local uh, locals um, that was the trip where I had a cartel thug threatened to kill me and I laughed at him and told him he didn't have the cojones to mess with the mean little gringo um, but it was the, the adventure was so incredible that I had to write a, a great story. Now, book trip, mm -hmm. that, that book was called The Curse of Cortez. It was the first one I yes. wrote, but the second one I produced, I published. Yes. And Kirkus uh, recommended it. They they called it, uh, in, and book trip called it, was uh, one of their 25 favorite books of 2021. They called it Indiana Jones meets Da Vinci Code. Yeah. Um, it's, it's got action, adventure, humor, romance, um, and deep morals and lessons about society and where we've come and how people have used religion to basically do evil things. Well, yes, they have. <laughs> they certainly have. So you know, it's a fun story. And it, it has many of the characters, the guy that the thug that threatened to kill me, his name was Shea Golan ends up as a character in the story as one of the villains. Yeah. Uh, a, a seaplane pilot who was completely hilarious, who when I first met him and saw his plane, my honest to God thought was, OK, this is how I die. Um, yeah. it, and so he went, got into the story. A few other people that I know were made characters in the story, including my wife. Um, so it, it has a lot of personal elements to it in terms of my own mm -hmm. personality and adventures. But underneath it all is this incredible amount of history and research. Yes, um, and yes. It's a fun, fun story. Um, well, I, I love when people do the proper um, research for books um, because I'm one of those folks mm -hmm. that will look it up and I will say this is accurate or this is not accurate or whatever have you. I'm one of those people. So if you're going to do something based and have history part of it, you know, you've got to do it right. Well, and I, on my website, I actually publish fact versus fiction pages because mm -hmm. there's so much fact intermingled with the fiction that I feel it's um, it's respectful to my readers to be transparent. Yes, 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 yes. Well, you mentioned the Kirkus reviews and, um, you know, this this is uh, incredible. Recommendations from Kirkus have compared you to Dan Brown, Iris Johansson or Robert Ludlum. I mean, mm -hmm. goodness, how does that make you feel? It was, you know, it was gratifying um, uh, to to say that I, I, you know, to say that I'm producing a good quality product. And and mm -hmm. I've always been driven by quality. And bef when I first wrote the first version of Cortez, mm -hmm. I hired a 
editor who was from Simon and Schuster, who is now working at Amazon. And mm -hmm. I asked her, I paid her a lot of money. I was working at the time, so I had I'm a sure lot of money. <laughs> uh, and I basically said, I want you to use this as my masterclass. I want you to rip this up, tear it apart and show me how to stitch it back together. I, I said, mm -hmm. I want this to be the best it can be. I know I can't get there unless I fix the problems I may not even be aware of. Right. And God bless her. <laughs> She gave me 44 pages of notes and then had hand and basically marked comments on every single page of the manuscript. Oh, when I wow. first got her feedback back, now I had asked her to be ruthless with me, but when I first got it back, there was a part of me that said, Oh God, I suck. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. But I, I, once I got past the, you know, licking my wounds stage, I said, okay, yeah. well, let's, let's get to work. Let's take this one comment at a time, one page at a time. Let's do this. Yes. And I, I was so grateful because the, the, while the basic story was still there, she really helped me to polish it into an incredible page turner. And to yeah. then get a Kirkus recommendation out of that was, yeah. um, I, I I did. It was it was a. It felt good to say that I that the hard work was going to pay off, and that this was yeah. something I could do and and not embarrass myself by doing. Yes, um, yes. And so, but I I put that level of effort into every book uh, because I think every book is a standalone. You can have five great books, and as soon as you have one bad one, that's all people remember. Yeah. Um. And so I try to really put in a tremendous amount of research and care. Uh, into every single book and um, trying to make them each a unique experience so that I'm not falling into a, a routine. Exactly. Now, the second book, Swarm, yes. Yes. was inspired, and that one was um, was Reader's Favorites Gold Award for Thriller, uh, was yes. on IAN uh, Book of the Year, finalist for Book of the Year, uh, also Kirkus recommended. Um, yes. Swarm was based on the program that had escaped the Lawrence Livermore Labs. Now I turned that yes. program into a character in the book named Sylvia, okay. Sophisticated okay. Language Virtual Intelligence Algorithms, in the, the fictional narrative. Now, what was interesting about that experience is in 2016, CNN reported that Russia had hacked a CIA cyber toolkit. And in that toolkit, was every single one of the functional attributes I had assigned to this missing program, including what we now call the deep fake video technology. Yes. And then they sold that kit on the dark web. Mm. So that is the premise for the book, my espionage series, which includes Swarm and The Last Ark, and I'm working on the third in the series now. Um, wow. But I combine that with how artificial intelligence is being used in espionage, how it's being used in cybersecurity and cyber warfare, how it's being used in weapon development, um, and mm -hmm. how that clashes with our current world political instability, um, yes. with climate and politics and Ukraine and fascism and election mm -hmm. and interference and all of these other things that we're currently mm -hmm. working with. I try yeah. to blend those things together to paint a scenario of, gee, what could go wrong in all of this and, and how might that look? And yes. But one of the things I try to do different than like um, the, the Tom Clancy's or the Robert Ludlum's is I don't want my character, my main characters to be, now a couple of them are, but I don't want my main character to be that typical, you know, John Ryan, who's a CIA or a Navy SEAL or, you know, trained to kill you seven ways before Sunday, sir. Um, right. I wanted him to be, I, I wanted him to be intelligent, uh, but humorous, right. almost sarcastic and witty um, right. to, to an extreme, but a flawed individual who, incorporate some of the traumas that I've gone through. Right. Um, some of my characters are autistic or they're, they, they grew up in the foster care system in California and yeah. have real trust issues and real identity issues. And mm -hmm. they're pulling through, they're, they're trying to do the right thing in spite of all of the circumstances against them, including the struggles that they're having internally. Wow. And I wanted to create characters that were in my mind, um, more identifiable for me as opposed to the superhero, super patriot, bleeds red, white, and blue character. Yeah, yes, I yeah, got so, you. Um, so my char main character is actually living under the name of a false, of a friend who died in an explosion that was meant for him. 
Ah. So he's still hiding from the people who want him dead, which tie back to the Bilderberg Illuminati structure. And he's ah. he basically uh, has to go through life as a with living under all of these lies just to keep his identity secret until that becomes impossible for him. And then he's basically a fugitive. And so I wanted wow. someone who was um, a good guy, but not mm -hmm. a your typical um always on the right Maybe side of the long guy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And let me just make sure I clarify this. Swarm and the Lost Ark are part of a series. That's correct. They both have the, a lot of the same characters, including the Sylvia, my main character, whose name is Derek, um, an admiral's daughter who lost um, her mom with, to cancer when she was young and was raised by this very autocratic admiral who she mm -hmm. both loves and resents. Um, and, 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 and then a few people in the government who are the typical kind of government uh, kind of people. Um, and then it, it involves characters from all around the world. And these are characters based on people that I've met in my world travels. And so mm -hmm. the, the program and the main character, Derek, have basically created sort of this underground group called SNOW, S-N-O pronounced SNOW. And mm -hmm. it stands for SpyNet Online. And yeah. it's essentially confidential informants who don't even under, know who each other are. Um, wow. And they're all basically um, um, uh, living in and sort of working with this program, Sylvia, that they all respect, but none of them, most of them don't even know Sylvia is a program. Wow. And so they're all confidential informants from every walk of life, every nation, uh, every economic status. And they're all basically providing clues and information and resources for the for Derek and, and Sylvia to basically go after the bad guys. Um, and so it's an incredible kind of story. We deal with um, um, real weapons, artificial intelligence weapons that are being yeah. developed at DARPA today and how those might be misused or maybe malfunction. Now, in the last arc, uh, one of the, the main premises of the last arc is also true. Um, mm -hmm. Most people know about the Ark of the Covenant that's in Ethiopia. Uh, it mm -hmm. left Israel 2,600 years ago with Solomon's son named Menelik with 500 mm -hmm. priests. It was on Elephant Island in Egypt for several hundred years until the Romans chased them away. It was mm -hmm. in synagogues in Ethiopia for a few hundred years until the uh, Templars basically came and moved it into churches. And it's been in this one church for over 900 years. And um, all of that's factual. There's history, there's scrolls, there's archaeology, there's all kinds of factual documentation of all these events. Right. Um, in January, what me, most people don't know, though, Mm -hmm. is that in January 21, 750 men, women, and children were massacred as a militia stormed the church in Axum and stole the ark and sold it on the black market. Oh, my so God. I, I deal with that now black market ark, who I believe might have had the power and the influence to send the militia in to steal it for them and what they want to use it for. Now, that also combines with another story. In the 1960s, there was a, a copper scroll discovered in Qumran or outside in one of the caves near Qumran, which is where all the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Mm -hmm. But different than all the Dead Sea Scrolls, this one was hidden behind a fake mud brick wall and discovered mm -hmm. by accident. And when mm -hmm. they finally took years to basically unravel this brittle copper scroll and read it, it had 64 locations where pre-Babylonian priests had hidden tens of tons, billions and billions of dollars of, dollars of gold and silver in temple vessels. And Ooh. in the 64th location is a second copper scroll that describes where Jeremiah hid the Ark of Testimony made by Moses. Ah. Uh, this story is confirmed in the second book of Maccabees that this happened, but no one, no, no one knew whether it was myth or, or real. Now, for 50 years, since the 60s or 70s, people have been trying to follow the locations described in this sort of treasure map scroll. And right. they were all looking in Jerusalem, and they were all wrong. Nobody found anything. Mm -hmm. About right. seven years ago, a, an American named Jim Barfield actually decoded every single one of those 64 locations underneath the archaeological ruins of Qumran. He convinced the Jewish Sanhedrin, which is their priest group trying to rebuild the temple, that he, mm -hmm. he was right. They went and convinced the Israeli archaeology and antiquities group to go out and do a metal scan. They confirmed mm -hmm. non-ferrous metals under every single one of those locations. But they only dug down about two feet, even though the scroll said nine to 12 feet to dig. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, and tried to cover up the rumor and basically tried to kill the rumors that were going around Jerusalem at the time. The reason why is because Pal that Qumran is part of the Palestinian West Bank. Right. By law, if they dug up anything there, they couldn't keep it. They'd have to put it in some sort of military warehouse where the international tribune in Israel would never see anything. Right. So that right. was about the same time that they also started talking about a single state solution. So um, because only under a single state solution will they be able to go and dig this stuff up and keep what they find. So both of those things have to do with then I deal with some artificial intelligence issues around a RAND corporation uh, study that was submitted to the DOD that said that AI data poisoning was one of our top 10 strategic risks in our nation to our national security. So all of these things kind of come to play along with a fictional former U.S. president who is under criminal indictment uh, and ready to go to trial under multiple criminal indictments, ready to go to trial when he flees to Saudi Arabia to declare asylum, where he and the crown prince basically try to restart a peace deal with these arcs and all of these things come into play. So um, it's a great story. Um, that story, one of my Goodread, um, Goodreads reviewers basically compared it that if Dan Brown and Tom Clancy were to write a story, it would look like the last arc. Well, I've been taking notes because <laughs> because I'm so intrigued uh, with the history of this, and I, I certainly have to receive these books. <laughs> I, I can, I can get you an ACR um, ebook copy. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Wow. And so, oh my goodness, I won't even go into all of this because I'm I'm just so so mind boggled. I'm a lover of history. So I've jotted some notes, but I'll check I do too. I love history. I love, I love how all of these things basically intertwine. Now, one of the themes on both books yes. is that this program that has escaped has now reached what we call um, uh, sentient singularity. Now, sentient is the level of where a, an AI program is self-aware, uh, basically oh. of its own existence. Now that used to be a taboo topic. However, mm -hmm. there are now 15 to 25 companies and tens of billions of dollars going into the research between the United States, Europe, and China for companies actually working actively on creating a sentient level AI. Um, part okay. of that combines with quantum computing and everything else. I won't go into that. I, I, in my books, while they deal with a lot of these things, they're really easy to read. I don't go deep into yes. the, the, the technolo technology. That's part of my research, but my job is to simplify it for the reader. Um, so that this program has now reached a sentient level and what we call singularity. Singularity is the stage where a single program is as smart as a human. Now, I'm assuming it's as smart uh, as a smart human rather okay. than a dumb one. And, um, and so this program has now decoded end time prophecy. And uh, none of the other characters are really hyper religious. Um, one character, Jen had this background when she was a child, but discounted it as part of her mother's dealing with her cancer and her pending death. Uh, none of the other characters are really religious at all. They're somewhat agnostic. So none of the characters are really understanding what Sylvia is trying to tell them because she's not mm -hmm. doing it in a dogmatic religious way. It right. has to do with these events have already occurred. Here's the probability of those events occurring. Here's the probability that it would be by random chance that all of these would be by random chance. And so she's taking a very typical AI analytical approach to the problem mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. looking at scenarios that have happened over the last 60, 70 years now and correlated them to prophecy and is trying to basically warn the characters of what's going on and concluding, concluding that prophecy is, since all of these things have already occurred, prophecy is less about God destroying humanity as much as humanity would destroy itself. Correct. And Correct. so it's trying to call out sort of the self-destructive nature of how sometimes our world systems work, the power structures and, and the um, how, you know, we know to do, we've been climate change being a typical example. We've known about it at, at a consumer level for at least 20 mm -hmm. years and mm -hmm. we're still kicking the can down the road. Yes, um, okay. <laughs> and, 
And so there's dangers to AI that are not being well talked about commonly among the press and other places. Right. And so it really is trying to deal with some of the political issues and the climate issues and the population and, and air, um, 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 apostate trends within the church. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's trying to look at some of those things, but from a purely analytical objective perspective without a judgment of who, um, you know, kind of uh, on, on an individual level. And so it's an interesting premise to kind of bring in there because now my, my, my main character, Sylvia, the program has a unique perspective that none of the other characters share. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, but they keep see they can't deny the probabilities and, and the, the analysis it's doing. They're just mm -hmm. trying to reconcile their own um, journey of faith with what's going on while wow. the world is kind of blowing up around them. And exactly. so it, it creates a really interesting, unique premise um, to, to create for an AI. So if the AI isn't this dystopic, I'm going to take over the world kind of scenario, mm -hmm. but yet there's dangers that are facing us through AI in general. Uh, and it deals with sort of some of the uh, social and um, spiritual issues that we're all facing right. but without trying to make it a dogmatic argument. Right, right. Oh my gosh. This all sounds incredible. I can't wait to <laughs> to get my hands on some of this and check out some of this history. Well, with all of that said, let's switch right quick to your publishing journey. Um, what? How do you get published? Are you with a publishing company, a hybrid, self-published? You know, um, I'm self-published, and I, that was a decision I made after writing the second book, Swarm, and getting mm -hmm. having beta readers basically go gaga over Cortez and Swarm both. Mm -hmm. And I, I, because I think I'm dealing with really intense issues, for whatever reason, I don't, I couldn't really tell you exactly. I wasn't really getting a response from agents. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, I realized that there are things that a publisher can do that my training in corporation. In, in corp my corporate background allowed me to do. Um, I was perfectly good at going out and hire, finding and hiring a good editor and finding mm -hmm. and hiring good proofers and hiring professional developers. And if I was going to invest in the book, um, I wouldn't do a vanity press because I'm just paying them to basically do a mediocre job when I can pay myself right. to do a really good job. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the, the real benefit of, of a publisher is really around some of the marketing and, and distribution and some of the mm -hmm. other things. And so mm -hmm. I decided to go ahead. I was, I'm rather impatient. I'm, I've been known to be impatient and rather than kind of shopping these books for years until mm -hmm. I find somebody who finally says, yes, most of the people around me said, screw it, go build your audience, go get yeah. the books out, go get reviews, go get uh, people interested, yeah. start building your market. And if not this book, maybe the next one, you'll get a publisher and wow. it'll just be part of the continuation of the journey. So the fact that I've gotten uh, consistent Kirkus recommendations, I've gotten rewards from book trib and, and reader's favorite and uh, book life. And, and these are Publisher Weekly. These are um, uh, Barnes and Noble. These are these are major industry reviewers, basically wow. all um, validating the the quality of the books. That I, I wanted to continue this process and not feel like I'm just sitting and, and waiting. Now, in, in doing that, in terms of building the market, I, I formed a group called the Author Event Network, and we oh. we currently have about 38. I started January of 22. And, and we did about 10 events. So the purpose of Author Event Network is to take accomplished authors, both published in, in high quality indie, mm -hmm. and to go to events, festivals, and fairs. Now, these events can range between 5,000 to 50,000 people in attendance or more. Right. And where you go to these events, you know, your typical street fair kind of festival, you'll get cosmetics and honey and spices and art and crafts and t-shirts and toys and mm -hmm. but we're the only booth full of authors signing their own books right and so we did been very successful from a financial perspective a high rate a high roi on the cost of the i i'm it's the only place where i consistently can spend money and i'm not only getting the money of the event back but the cost of the book back and i'm still making profit right. um about a 30, 35% profit on all of that. 
So it's been a very uh, financially uh, good um, experience. And then, but I'm also building my readership. Uh, so I'll, I've had people come to my booth, buy one book, come back at a different event, buy another book, come back a couple weeks later, a different event, buy two more of the first book to give as gifts. So it's been building that audience and, and with a real kind of personal relationship with the reader, um, adding to my newsletters, and then also building my profit margins so I can basically fund the next book if that turns out to be what I do as opposed to an agent and a publisher. So right. it's um, it got me started. Now, I'm not against getting a publisher because I believe it would help my international sales and, and open up new markets yeah, and but... everything else. But um, I, I didn't want that to be, I wasn't going to wait for that to validate me. Exactly. Good for you. Good for you. Well, Gary, I will tell you, you've given my audience a lot to think about, not just purchasing your books, but living their lives. You've given us a lot of history that we should be looking up and checking out. You've given us a lot today and I really appreciate you. And you, what Rick. we'll do is have all of your contact information in the podcast show notes and Excellent. in the video description box on my YouTube channel. Gar Guy, excuse me. I, I think I called you Gary. Forgive me. Guy, okay. I want your name to be Gary. <laughs> Guy, thank you so much for joining the book. Of thank Holocaust. you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.